Copper did fairly well in November, rallying with stock markets. But what's the outlook for that crucial metal and for other industrial metals? We're joined by Sam Crittenden of RBC Capital Markets. It's great to see you, Sam. Thanks very much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Let's have a look at a one-year chart for copper. What's driving the copper price right now? Yeah, so it's interesting. Copper peaked at about 480 back in March, and since then it's been sort of in steady decline until these, these recent rallies we've seen in November. So much like the broader market, it's tracking quite closely the U.S. dollar, sentiment around the Fed, inflation, and all of those factors that are driving the rest of the market are certainly impacting copper. The other thing clearly is China and their efforts to move past COVID or, you know, locking down, unlocking down sort of this, you know, a dynamic situation that's happening there is clearly moving the copper price. And there's, is there a clear trend in copper or will it just stay volatile for now? 2022 was a choppy year. Unfortunately, I think 2023 is likely to repeat that. The thing we're seeing is historically low inventory levels. So there's no buffer of supply or excess capacity sitting around. In copper. Yeah, oh, that's so that, that tends to, to drive this excess volatility we're seeing in the market right now. And so I, I would expect that to continue into 2023 because you know, we still are dealing with slowing global growth. China's still managing through a slow property sector, and there are still risks that we that we see into next year. Beyond that, it could get much more interesting. Because we are looking at an electrifying world, I know that's an awful cliche, but we're going to have to rebuild the grids for one thing, and presumably that'll need vast amounts of copper. Absolutely. So we see tremendous copper demand growth over the next five, 10 years, and, and really there hasn't been enough supply identified to match that, and, and nowhere close. And so I'm quite optimistic over the next two to three years on on copper prices and, and what that could look like for, for copper and also the miners that produce it. I'm just trying to think of new supply coming on. I've got first, Quantum's Cobra Panama has been around for quite a while. Yeah. But we have the big tech, uh, Quebrada 2, and also, I suppose, um, the turquoise hill mine in Mongolia as it goes underground. So there is some new supply. Yeah, so we had in 2017 and 2018 a period of strong copper prices. And so you saw a lot of projects get sanctioned and moved into construction and, and move forward. Mm. That was the low-hanging fruit. Those were things that were sitting on the shelf. They were engineered, permitted, ready to go. A lot of that supply is coming online this year, next year, into 2024 in some cases. So we do see a, a little bit of a supply response in the coming two years. So that's why we're not overly optimistic on our price estimates for next year. But beyond that, 2025 and beyond, there really hasn't been much identified to come onto the market. Um, if we could use the dollar per pound price right now, I know a lot of people in the industry use the London price, but copper just failed to get to $5 a pound earlier this year. What is your, uh, and now it's $4 and change, what's your outlook for copper over the next couple of years? Yeah, so we have a 375 copper price for next year. As I said, I think Quite there's- Quite conservative. Then. It is, and, and it's kind of a middle of the road price. I mean, I think there's upside risks, certainly. If, if the recession is mild and we can move past that quickly, if China reopens, that's that's certainly the upside. On the downside, if, if the slowdown is worse than expected or there's other hiccups and this supply does come online as expected, you know, you could see a lower price. And that's so that's why we've taken that middle of the road approach. Beyond that, we have a four dollar copper price in 2025, and I think there's clearly upside to those estimates, you know, as as I identified earlier. Yeah, I got it wrong. Of course, copper's three dollars and change right now. But you see, copper in two thousand twenty-five getting to about four bucks a pound. Yeah, four four dollars is our assumption in twenty twenty-five, and you know that's based on an incentive price to bring on new supply. But given rising costs to develop new mines, ESG concerns, I think there's clearly upside to that number. That's interesting. Peru, endless protests. And Peru's a pretty, it's the world's number two. Endless protests against mines or friction yeah. with communities. And it's the world's number two copper producer. Both Chile and Peru have been flashpoints in, in recent years from changing politics. And so, you know, Peru has been one place where the Las Bombas mine in particular has been starts and stops, and you see it sort of week to week. Um, they've had challenges with the community there. So it's, it's just something you have to manage. Some companies have been able to, to do that well. Chile has a tax regime coming. Hopefully it ends in, a, you know, sort of a gets to a moderate place that, that the mining industry can live with. Um, but certainly that is a risk to supply, that 40% of the world's copper comes from those two countries. Wow, yeah. I've got to ask you, what about the prospects for a supply cartel in metals? Um, copper, do you think that's possible? Would they get together and do that? <sighs> Copper's a bit too fragmented. I mean, certainly regionally, you could think about doing some, some you know, getting together and making some production decisions, but I don't, I've, I don't think it's likely in copper. It's just, it's too spread out across the planet. Nickel, though, might be another matter. 
Potentially, there's a huge amount of investment happening in Indonesia, in particular, in partnership with China. So I don't know if it's necessarily a cartel or something like that, but certainly as supply chains build out for electric vehicles, it becomes more and more concentrated in certain areas, and Indonesia in particular. So it becomes a question of, can other, other countries get access to that material? And how does that supply chain you know, build up over the next few years? It's interesting. So China's been investing in Indonesian nickel. So presumably that's to secure their own supply. It's all about batteries. Uh, I mean, to some degree right now, it's about stainless steel because that's still the biggest use of nickel. Right. But obviously as the battery you know, chain gets evolves over the next few years, there's a huge amount of nickel that needs to go into that. A lot of the batteries are manufactured in China. There's a lot of processing capability being built right now. And so they're doing those investments to secure that nickel supply for the future. How about gold? Uh, what, what should we bear in mind when we think about gold right now? Uh, gold is uh, sort of a bit out of my wheelhouse at the oh, moment sure. as I'm more focused on base metals, yes. but certainly it is moving around with rates and, and the US dollar and everything else. It's perked up a little bit here these last few days. Uh, and just finally, zinc, any interest there? It's an important product for tech, for example. Yeah, zinc prices have held in really well. I mean, European smelters have really struggled. You've seen about 5% of global zinc capacity come offline in, in, the, in recent months because of high power prices. So it's an interesting metal. There's not a lot of ways to get exposure to it. Tech is one way, as you mentioned. So the outlook there is quite good. It's more tied to global growth and you don't necessarily have that pull from electric vehicles or something like copper and nickel do.